Small uh, is the chair of the uh, Phyllis Berger Memorial Lecture Committee, as well as being its sole member. Uh, <laughs> so so we, we do thank her, although she's, she's not here to, to hear that. Uh, from, um, from the Dean's Office, we, even though this is uh, not directly sponsored by the Dean's Office, uh, I'd like to welcome Dean Nicole Ray uh, from the College of Letters and Science. His staff uh, assisted in the, in the publicity and the creation of, uh, of some of the materials that uh, went out for advertising, and we're very, very grateful for that. Uh, also to uh, the MSU Foundation, who uh, graciously uh, also assisted in, in the publicity, and, and Melissa Dillon is here uh, representing the Foundation, so thank you for coming. Um, from our own staff, um, uh, Francesca Pine, who's our newest uh, hire, uh, worked very hard. She's in the back. Um, she worked uh, with some of the, uh, the, the advertising as well. And our office manager, Lisa Stevenson, who's uh, over taking <laughs> pictures there. Uh, she uh, was particularly uh, hard working in, in the area of, of uh, the reception. And she wanted me to tell you that, to, to remind you that we do have uh, little, little uh, reception following, and there'll be some hors d'oeuvres uh, so that we can visit with Joe at a more, uh, more leisurely uh, fashion. The Berger Lecture is made possible by the generosity of Mrs. Uh, Phyllis Berger, who is a graduate from what is now Montana State University in 1941 in zoology. And she was very uh, kind to, to allow um, her estate to, to come to our uh, use. And it's uh, her generosity that allows us not only to have the Phyllis Berger Memorial Lecture, but also the MSU powwow, which is in April uh, 3rd and 4th. Insert shameless plug here. Uh, so, so we hope that uh, we'll see you at the powwow, which is likewise a Native American Studies and a American Indian Council uh, program. Uh, Phyllis Berger was instrumental in, in, uh, in uh, allowing uh, the Department of Native American Studies to, uh, to have a, a number of cultural and, and academic uh, enrichment type programs. And when we, we decided to honor her with this uh, lecture series, we had only two, really only two criteria that we wanted to follow. And, and Dr. Wayne Stein, Emeritus from Native American Studies, is sitting down here, and he was chair of the department at that time. And, and it was under his guidance that we decided that we would have, uh, we would want to feature a Native artist, writer, or scholar. And, and we've only, defeat, uh, only di uh, diverted from that on, on several occasions, once when the then governor of the state of Montana, Mark Roscoe, uh, delivered our Berger Lecture. And then we expanded the definition of, of, uh, of scholars to include indigenous scholars. Uh, we had a, a Native Hawaiian scholar on one occasion, and then a, an Aboriginal scholar from, from uh, Australia. Uh, the second, the second uh, part of that was that we wanted to feature scholars, writers, poets, uh, artists, people that we wanted to hear and, and allow them to, to select the topic of their choice. And so we, we have done that uh, with the other 26 uh, lectures that we've had. Uh, this year, uh, Joe Gaughan is our featured speaker. And there's also a tie. Uh, it has been our culture to uh, ask the, the holder of the Katz family chair to serve as, as our, our Berger Lecturer as well. And so that this year, we have that double pleasure of having not only um, a, a scholar come to visit us, but to come as, as uh, the Katz family endowed chair of Native American Studies. There are only three or four endowed chairs in Native American Studies in the known universe, and Joe is one of them. Um, this this uh, chair is, is uh, supported by a, a, a couple in Maryland by the name of Audrey and, and um, 
Shelley, uh, Sheldon Katz, and we're very pleased that they were able to uh, make the uh, endowed chair possible for us uh, in making our program uh, somewhat unique. And so Joe is serving double duty tonight, and, and happily so. Uh, Joseph P. Gaughan is an associate professor of psychology in the clinical area and American culture in Native American studies at the University of Michigan. And I've practiced very hard not to say Michigan State University, the other <laughs> issue. Uh, and he is here as a visiting professor slash um, holder of our catch chair for, for a one year period. Uh, his, uh, he has uh, earned his undergraduate degree from Harvard College in 1992 and his doctorate in clinical community psychology from the University of Illinois at Urbania, Cat Champaign, in 2001. During his graduate training, he served as the Charles A. Eastman Dissertation Fellow at Dartmouth College mm -hmm. prior to his completion of his psychology internship at the McLean Hospital, Harvard Medical School. Uh, Joe is the author of uh, many articles and chapters, and uh, they appear in such publications as the Annual Review of Clinical Psychology, Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology, the Counseling Psychologist, and the American Journal of uh, Community uh, Psychology, and the uh, Haver Daily News paper. <laughs> <laughs> widely, widely published. Uh, and and uh, more recently, uh, Joe was named the uh, fellow in the John uh, Simon uh, Guggenheim Memorial Foundation. And uh, he's a peacetime veteran of the U.S. Army and a former West Point cadet. Uh, he is here in Boston with his family, uh, and that includes uh, Taya Miles and their three children. Uh, both of whom were subject to a very nice article by Carol. I think I saw her, Carol Schmidt. A wonderful article that you'll see on the front page of the MSU uh, uh, website entitled uh, They've Gone Miles, Weekly <laughs> uh, Two Prominent Scholars Using Awards to Research at Montana State University. And so would you welcome Joseph Gaughan. Then I'd like to review these features with reference to four vignettes associated with my research. And finally, I'll summarize the implications of this research for pursuing greater pluralism in psychology. So let's start just by introducing this post-colonial predicament as the background, the context for mental health concerns within American Indian communities. On the one hand, many of our reservation communities have rather urgent needs. Uh, that is, our communities many times represent impoverished, high-risk settings that have been shown to give rise to documented disparities in mental health status, higher rates uh, of certain kinds of mental disorders, for example. So, um, on the one hand, we have these desperate needs, which any visitor to our community often can recognize pretty readily. But on the other hand, the clinical services that are developed and designed to remedy these sorts of problems are often considered incongruent. And by incongruent, I mean they're considered culturally incongruent in many respects. One way that Indian people often talk about this in the context of mental health in reservation communities is to assert rather than pursuing greater additional clinical services, they will instead opine that our culture is our treatment and look backward to tradition to try and figure out how best to harness it 
for remedying the ills of Indian country today. Now, these commitments uh, to an alternative approach lie in this concern with incongruent cultural or clinical services. And these have been attested to both by regular Indian people you talk to who work in the behavioral health center within Indian reservation settings, as well as by various research studies that look into this. Uh, for example, in Midwestern reservations, many family members have been asked to rank order the kinds of helping services they would find most beneficial. And they rank elders and healers and traditional leaders and cultural authorities at the top of their list, but psychologists, psychiatrists, and Indian health service personnel much lower. Now, it's one thing to say that clinical services are incongruent. That's another thing to try and unpack what that might mean. And so today, that's what I want to do in the time that we have, is to talk a little more in depth in the context of a single reservation community about the ways in which clinical services might be incongruent in cultural terms. And this is going to reveal, I think, on the one hand, limitations of mainstream psychology when it comes to addressing mental health concerns in Indian country. And of course, on the flip side, the need for a more expansive and diverse, or rather pluralist, conceptions of psychology than typically are found. So let's start with a vignette. That stems from the community mental health research I've undertaken in the past on the Fort Belknap Reservation in Montana. So you have here, of course, the state of Montana, you have the seven reservations uh, here, and then we've zoomed in on the north central area where the Fort Belknap Reservation lies. Now the Fort Belknap Reservation, as some of you might know, is home to two peoples, the Grovant and the Cinnaboyant uh, nations. And uh, my particular interest as a member of the Grovant nation is to study something about the mental health concerns of Grovant people. And so I began undertaking research in the late 1990s that was designed to explore and understand how mental health issues are talked about and experienced among Grovant people. And my particular interest in doing so was ultimately to try and trace out what some of the implications of that understanding might be for mental health services specifically. So I undertook a series of open-ended, discovery-oriented interviews. That is, I didn't start out knowing or guessing what people would say. I wanted to ask questions that would lead them to talk in their own terms about how they thought about mental health issues. And I got several intriguing leads from things people told me that warranted further inquiry. And so I spent some time over the past decade trying to trace these leads to find out the ways in which mental health might be experienced and expressed among Fort Belknap robots. Now what's interesting about many of the things that I found out during these interviews starting in the late 90s was that some of the things I heard were very much marked by what we call interpretive ambiguity. <coughs> that is, there was some sense that perhaps these were familiar enough that didn't indicate anything all that different and therefore could have been easy to overlook or ignore unless one traced them out in a lot more depth and nuance. So let's start then by offering some examples of the things I heard that led me to wonder if there could be a different sense or sensibility surrounding mental health concerns at Fort Belknap. Just as a prelude, as a graduate student, when I was off at home, people would endlessly ask, are you done yet? And then the second question would be, uh, well, so what are you taking up over there again? And I would explain that I was a psychologist taking up mental health concerns and issues. And as soon as I said I was a psychologist taking up mental health concerns, people would avert their gaze and start shifting nervously on their feet and make some kind of joke about mind reading. <laughs> now, I took from this that people were a bit uncomfortable with the idea that I could be in assessing their mental status as we stood there visiting, and that they had some interest in guarding one's thoughts from intrusive attention and assessment in more general terms. Of course, there's nothing necessarily stand that stands out about that. Many people make jokes about psych psychologists who try to um, obtain insights into their character, or they even joke about diagnosis casually in the presence of a psychologist. And so, um, hard to know exactly what it meant. Now, once I began my research, a key person I talked to, who chose to be identified by his Indian name of traveling center, had a lot to say, it turns out, about mental health concerns that illuminated things in more detail. Traveling Thunder was a middle-aged traditionalist, also an environmental activist on the Fort Belknap Reservation. And what was interesting to me about talking with him was that he himself had no direct experience with mental health services. Um, I was particularly interested in finding out more about how Grovance understood depression and drinking at Fort Belknap as these 
uh, experiences played out. But what I obtained from Traveling Thunder was what we might refer to as a plaintive discourse of distress. That is, he offered an account of community mental health problems um, that was pretty interesting and unique. And uh, medical anthropologists were referring to this kind of account as an explanatory model, a way of talking about mental health concerns that stands up for its distinctive uh, causes and consequences in the way it uh, unfolds. What was interesting about Traveling Thunder's explanation was that he emphasized history and spirituality as the source and origin of mental health problems, much more than the kinds of things that psychologists are likely to talk about, which include biology and psychological facets. Indeed, he offered a very interesting historical lesson about where mental health problems in Fort Belknap come from by tracing four epics of history that began with a kind of paradise before European contact that continued through an era of colonization and then finally to um, a kind of post-colonial enemy that afflicted the community as a result of colonization and finally a return to the sacred the ceremonial practices of the people as a way to remedy that post-colonial enemy. So what was interesting about this was that in the current epic, he saw hope for returning to sacred ceremonies and their therapeutic effects as being beneficial. Now, Traveling Thunder had some very distinctive things to say that I thought were kind of interesting, and again, lend themselves to the possibility for an alternative cultural psychology at work, but which could, of course, have simply been something that sounded much more familiar to psychologists in general. Let me give some examples of what I mean. So, for one example, Traveling Thunder offered a rationale for ceremonial participation that I thought was pretty interesting. He said, quote, what that ceremony does is you put up a sacrifice, an effort, a personal sacrifice, a family sacrifice, a group sacrifice. And what you're doing is you're calling on the creator, the spirit world, and what they call the grandfather spirits for something, for life, or for good health, or for a good, clean mind, an alcohol and drug-free mind, or you're calling on the spirit world for guidance, you know, or for survival, even survival. <clears throat> so what was interesting to me about this particular description of the approach of ceremony to remedying some of the mental health problems of Fort Belknap was that one of the five domains he listed was that ceremony petition could lead to a, quote, good, clean mind. That's interesting language to me. Now, there's some ambiguity, as I say, interpretive ambiguity, some sense of not knowing really what to make of it, because this could have simply been a possible link to a broad discourse of recovery that happens through Alcoholics Anonymous and other kinds of self-help movements in Indian country. The idea of being clean and sober, for example, would be another phrase that might reference that discourse. Clean and sober, good, clean mind. Hmm. Also, our traveling planner talked about ceremony as being not, necess not necessary for overcoming these problems. Helpful, but not necessary. I asked him at one point, do you think a person could quit drinking without getting involved in ceremony or tradition? He said, oh yeah, I think a person could, with their mind. I think they, if they can if they're strong-minded. I know a few people that did that on their own. They just got fed up with it. And they figured, well, it cost too much money, it cost too much problems. They just quit. These strong-minded people, they quit like that. But as a mass majority, I think that the culture and stuff would be better, easier. And so he identified this notion of strength of mind as an interesting resource for overcoming causal behaviors. Now, the ambiguity I see here, of course, is that there's a widespread appreciation and regard for willpower in broader society. Perhaps that's all he's really talking about here. A third instance is he also qualified that not all ceremonies were necessarily good for overcoming these kinds of problems. And the example he gave um, as one that would not would be participation in peyote ceremonies to the Native American church. He said, quote, I said, as he was talking to someone who was promoting any Native American church practice, well, this peyote, does it make you hallucinate and see things? Does it mess your mind up? I wanted to know the mental feeling you get on this peyote. The same kind of reaction it does to your mind is the same thing the different drugs, the white man's drugs does to them. It makes you hallucinate, imagine things in your mind. Your mind is different. It mixes up your mind. So here was the sense that not all ceremony can be helpful. There are dangers in the ceremony of the Native American church because of the mind-altering substances that are used, even within a ceremonial context. Now, some ambiguity here, too, because many of the recovery from addictions will reject the use of drugs as 
as a way of getting help, even though there are many psychopharmacological treatments that are available for substance dependence. So, not sure what to make of it. Fourth and finally, I asked him very clearly, under what conditions would one seek help for mental health services? Um, and specifically, I asked him, under what conditions would you take your family members with these kinds of problems down to IHS to see psychologists and behavioral health? He got quiet about that. And he waited a second or two and then said, if you look at the big picture, look at your past, your history, where you come from, and you look at your future, where the white man's leading you, I guess you could make a choice. Where do I want to end up? I guess a lot of people want to end up looking good to the white man. Then it'd be a good thing to do. Go to the white psychiatrist in the reservation clinic and say, well, go ahead and rid me of my history, my past, and brainwash me forever so I can be like a white man. I guess that'd be a choice each individual will have to make. <clears throat> so he attested here to the fact that formal mental health services, at least in his perspective, represented assimilated dangers that could transform one's mentality result in brainwashing. Now, the end of here, I think, is one that you could take this as a concern mostly about culture, maybe more so than about mind. But it's interesting. I close this part of the talk with just an epilogue, which I received a letter from a relative that I wanted to cite here, because I think it has bearing on the things we're talking about. This relative was telling me a little bit about some things in her life that she wrote the following. I guess I see myself as righteous, giving with no ulterior motive and with high expectations of those I know. And I am very afraid of God and the one above. These traits of mine are based upon that fear. One time, I was very angry and spoke of the person I was angry with in my son's presence. And I said, I wished that person would die in some form or another. My son told me it was a moral wrong. Just that, stated it matter of factly. Yet, his opinion brought all the fears I had to a head, and I realized how wrong I was. So here we have a sense that something like bearing ill will towards someone else, saying something like, I wish they would die, is tied up with the socio-moral and spiritual domains, and that there's something about wishing or speaking ill of others that could be dangerous and <clears throat> immoral. Now, there's an ambiguity about that, I suppose. I mean, many people are superstitious, we might say, about good fortune or jinxes or whatever. So who knows what that really meant. In summary, these were all intriguing, but all quasi-familiar, and therefore potentially assimilated to what we already know as professional psychologists through our training, for example, absent some deeper pursuit or sense of consideration. But beyond traveling the funders' interesting explanatory model, I wonder, could these details represent intriguing glimpses into facets of a distinctive cultural psychology at work in this community? And if so, what might this imply about psychology, mental health, and mental health services? Let's go with a second vignette, Old Lodge's life. Old Lodge's life is a manuscript produced by my great-grandfather, Frederick Peter Gaughan, in 1942. It is a narrative account of the life of a famous medicine man and prominent robot leader named Bull Lodge, born in, around 1802 and died in 1886. Bull Lodge was interesting because he suffered from an impoverished childhood and became very devoted as a result to our sacred feather pipe, one of two really important ceremonial um, objects in our community. In fact, he was so desperate for a better life, even as a boy, he prayed incessantly for a successful life and a prominent career, as so many grown up men aspired to. One result of all of this prayer when he was a boy was at the age of 12, he had a vision. And in this vision, a shield descended from above. There's a picture of the shield of there, as my great grandfather drew it, based on the scripture. Descended from the heavens, and a voice spoke and said, all that you have asked is given you. All you'll need to do is follow some instructions and do what you're told. And the success you are desiring will become yours. <coughs> so soon after, as a teenager, he was instructed to fast and pray on seven different dates throughout central Montana. <coughs> he did each uh, of those fasts 
The uh, first fast requiring seven days and nights without food or water, and then the second fast six days and nights, and so on, all the way down to one day and overnight without food and water. And during these fasts, he received many gifts of power through visions of other than human beings <coughs> in the mountains and views who taught him how to live and how to be powerful. These things were to be exercised throughout his future life. And so Bullock's life is recounted um, in this text of this life narrative as first featuring Bullock as a young visionary, then as a grown man, a leader of a war party. Um, normally people didn't lead war parties and she was very regarded or had a lot of confidence because whoever led the war party was responsible if someone was lost. Bullock led three of these. He also then became an accomplished doctor in which he cured 19 cases. So in fact, it said he never lost a case of doctoring throughout his career. And finally, as an older man, he became a keeper of the sacred feather pipe, the very pipe which gave him a living, which he had begged as a boy. In the end, as his life was winding down, he had a vision in which he was gifted with the power of resurrection. But the ceremony that should have assured this could not be performed after his death because the buffalo were gone. As you all know, I'm sure. The white man is known for killing the buffalo and taking nothing but the wings. <laughs> <laughs> Bullock's life is of interest, of course, to robots in general. But my consideration of Bullock's life stems from a more personal connection to this narrative, the one that comes from the fact that my great grandfather was involved in this production. And so when we think about the origins of this particular text, Bullock's life was written by Fred Gunn during his employment in the Montana Writers Project. The Montana Writers Project was sponsored by the Works Projects Administration during the early 1940s. And uh, the Works Projects Administration uh, sponsored this because it decided that preservation of folklore and folk life ways was an important good in the era of the economic stimulus known as the New Deal. Uh, the Montana Writers Project in particular made sure to hire Indian informants or Indian field workers at every reservation that happened. Uh, and the goal was to put together a volume, a book, uh, an Indian series, in which all of the reservation field workers would send the things they wrote in and it could be compiled into a single volume and published. So most reservations in Montana had a field worker, and these writings are now housed right here at MSU in the archives. Now during his time as a field worker, just about a year, Fred Baum wrote roughly 400 pages of Grobon history and 300 pages of Grobon legends. His crowning achievement in all of this was the text for Bull Lodge's Life, which is roughly 170 pages of long script. He undertook this with close collaboration with Bull Lodge's daughter, because Bull Lodge, of course, was long dead by this time, but his daughter, the Garter Snake Woman, was an elderly woman at the time, and had been waiting, apparently, to convey this narrative to someone who would listen. This narrative was then published subsequently by a tribal member named George Horsecatcher, in 1980 under the title The Seven Visions of Bull Lodge. Now my feeling is that Bull Lodge's life is remarkable in two important ways. First, it's utterly distinctive as a published text that has been primarily mediated by robots themselves across multiple generations. You've got Bull Lodge living a life and talking about his life. You've got his daughter Snake Woman remembering and recounting this life. You've got my great grandfather who, as a field worker, takes this life, translates it into English, writes it down, and creates a narrative out of it. And then you've got Horse Catcher, who finds this narrative, edits it, and publishes it in 1980. As far as I'm aware, there are no other precedents in known scholarship for this kind of a tribally mediated textual production. So that's one way in which it's very distinctive. The other way, paradoxically, is that as far as I can tell, there's almost no published scholarship on this text. <clears throat> in fact, if you were to pull all the scholarship together, I'd probably have contributed half of it at this point. <laughs> I've sought to remedy this by analyzing the text myself from the perspective of a cultural psychologist. But there's lots of other ways to analyze this text, obviously. But probably psychology is one of the more far-fetched ones. <laughs> but the way I have sought to engage this text has been to um, look at it from the vantage point of crafting and understanding a cultural psychology of the one people. And one way that I have been taken in uh, with this text has been uh, in the scene that features the deathbed narratives that were attributed to Bolaj in this text. 
So, Bolaj had a vision when he was old. In the vision, he was told he had eight days left to live. He went to his teepee. He started making marks on the inside the lodge cover of each day, counting them down, and sent for his family, some of whom were scattered over the region. By the seventh day, his son had arrived home from afar, and that night, his family gathered at the teepee, and he told them that he had this vision, and that he was going to be dying the next day, and that he had other visions and told the whole set of experiences he had as a young man and about how he came to live the life that he had, which led them to that final night. Now, Garmersnake herself recounted that on this final night that my father was to die, he told many stories of his escapades and the many thrilling experiences he encountered during his past life, as if reviewing his life. Now, this sounds very familiar, as a modern audience can easily imagine the communicative crafting of a self-life narrative encompassing an individual legacy for posterity, what we might call the autobiographical impulse. But as I considered this interpretation, that Bulldoze's narratives of his deathbed with his family around him were mainly autobiographical, two problems stood out to me. The first is that autobiography itself is very much a product of modern modes of life. That is, it's steeped in reflexive selfhood, autonomous individualism, confessional expressivity, and a structure of possibilities for privacy. All things that are characteristic of modern life, but not traditional societies. And pre-reservation robot life was organized very much differently than this, such that something like the autobiographical impulse would not really have made much sense. Beyond this, the second problem was that the quote many stories of the escapades and the quote many thrilling experiences narrated by the Lodge that night appear for the text to include primarily war stories or coup tales that in some cases barely involve the Lodge himself. So if you look at this section of the text, the longest narratives that are recorded there are one involving the Lodge's war friend or enemy friend named Sits Like a Woman who had uh, led a war party that Bullodge was on, but the account was not about Bullodge. And second of all, another war party in which the narrative focused on the life and exploits of Bobtail Horse. Bullodge may have been on the original war party, but the story was not about him. Thus, on his deathbed, Bullodge chose to tell war stories. Here I felt was a bit of a mystery. Why would a dying man gather his family, kiss his grandbabies one last time before arranging them on his bed alongside him, and then begin to recount tales of hardship, violence, rivalry, and triumph that at least some cases appeared to have had little to do with himself. In sum, these final events of narration from Bolaz's life would seem to require some alternative account Vignette number three, a gambling contest. One potentially fruitful way to pursue such an alternative account for what was going on in Bulldogs' deathbed scene was to contextualize these ambiguous findings within the existing ethnographic record for the robots. Ethnography is a form of inquiry that anthropologists undertake. Now, many American Indian communities, as you might know, express ambivalence, to say the least, about anthropologists both past and present in their midst. But the robot case may be kind of different. <clears throat> First of all, anthropologist John Cooper visited Fort Belknap in 1938. He did so precisely because some of the old men among the tribe at that time were interested in having him come to make a record of their, quote, old way of life. In other words, he was invited in to preserve traditional <coughs> knowledge at that particular time and place. Father Cooper, because he was actually an ordained Catholic priest as well as an anthropologist, <coughs> brought along with him another junior anthropologist named Regina Flannery, both from Catholic University of America, and they began their anthropological work of documenting robot life. Their emphasis, particularly Father Cooper's emphasis, was on religious knowledge and practice, which is what the old men wanted them to preserve in particular. And my great great grandfather, the boy, was born in 1872 and died in 1956 
was a principal collaborator in this knowledge production, in part because the boy was widely known to be the last keeper of our sacred flat pipe. Not the feather pipe that Bull Lodge followed, but the flat pipe. In other words, this was a conversation and an interaction and a relationship that unfolded between priest and priest. Cooper's field work occurred between 1930 and 1948, 10 years before uh, he passed away with a manuscript that could be published posthumously. In light of Bulwaj's final oration, it seemed useful then to consider war among the pre-reservation Bulwaj. And if you consult this ethnographic work, you quickly learn that war honors were absolutely essential for a man's status and career, that war stories were a very consequential narrative genre, in fact, prominent men were ones who were supposedly um, had their wrists made slim by being pulled to their feet to account their war accounts, their war record, their war <coughs> exploits, time and time again in social life. And these war stories could be prominent on even really surprising occasions. And one such occasion could be the Grobot wheel game. So, the Grobot wheel game is a game. It's a game in which you have a stage, a field about the width of this stage with two logs on either end, and you have this wheel made out of a hoop and um, wrappings and some of beads in it. It's about this big around. And you have two contestants, and the goal is the two contestants take turns rolling the wheel down the field, and each of them with a, um, an arrow or a stick in their hands run side by side along the wheel and attempt to judge when the wheel is going to tip over onto the ground. The goal was to throw your arrow or your stick down right to the ground where the, the hoop is about to fall. And when the hoop falls on the arrow, then you get a point. And in particular, the particular ones of these beads end up touching that pole. You could win the whole game right then and there. Now, this was a competition that involved very high stakes gambling. There was no gambling competition among the robots that occasioned even more interest than this. What was interesting about it is that, of course, it involves both skill at being able to throw your stick and trot along and roll the wheel and that sort of thing, but also, of course, a degree of chance. No one can predict exactly how the wheels will fall, whether the beads can not align with your pole or not. And the very biggest games of this were uh, to occasion, like an occasion between enemy friends and war friends when they're rivally prayed, prayed out, played out in this particular fashion. And so my great 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 grandfather. Label uh, participated in one of these with some fanfare. Label was kind of a young man at the time. This was a game, first of all, only played by men, never played by women or, or um, children or women, and almost always by mature men. And in this case, Label had been made up of a war friend or enemy friend by an older man who was very prominent in the community named White Owl. So enemy friends are interesting because what happens is an accomplished warrior returns from a war party and gives a gift of booty of some kind, a knife, a gun, a scalp, to a young prominent man or some other rival that he wants to designate in the community. He gives this to them and starts a relationship in which there's pronounced rivalry that will happen for the rest of their lives. And this rivalry entails, first of all, making horrific fun person humiliating them if you can, publicly ridiculing them in every possible way. <coughs> and the person has to take it. Your enemy friend has to take it. If they lose their temper, it's really bad for them, and it shows that they're not worthy, actually, of being an enemy friend. And when you challenge such a person, they sort of have to, they're kind of obligated almost to follow up on the challenge. So White Owl, being an old prominent warrior and leader, sees that Label is an up-and-comer who looks like he has promise, and maybe could be a rival down the road. And so he makes Lainwall an enemy friend. An occasion arises where they can challenge each other, where White Owl can challenge Lainwall to the wheel game. Now, these wheel games between enemy friends in particular are big deals. Um, men would be known to lose everything they owned at this game. And because family members participate and uh, bet on behalf of their kin, they lose everything they have too, in the worst case instances. Now, Lainwall's father, um, but very much against this kind of gambling. But he's not one to sh not show solidarity with this thing. And because White Owl challenged his enemy friend to do this, Lane felt he couldn't really refuse. And so the game began. Now, White Owl didn't really have that much to lose, because in the worst case scenario, if he's beat by Lane it just shows he picked a young rival that was worthy of uh, the, 
the contest. And people would watch their rivalry all the more close to the course of their careers. But of course, if he beat Lane Bold, then his dominance would be cemented. And Lane Bold might go away humiliated and no longer be a potential threat to his status down the road. And so, in this contest, Lane Bold lost absolutely everything he owned. As soon as the contest was over, uh, White Powell's people went straight to his lodge, tore down his teepee, snatched the dishes out of his wife's hands, and left them with nothing. The result was that their mother and father kindly invited them over to eat, since they had nothing to eat themselves and nothing to eat at all, and they enjoyed a meal before Lane received a tongue lashing from his father for gambling so foolishly. In fact, the tongue lashing was so severe, and Lane had such regard for his father that he actually broke down. He was a very desolate person after this. He went out on the hills to cry and be alone for quite a while before he came back. Now, the good news about this particular story is that Lane will need it. He came back. Um, he, he, he took all of the ridicule and the teasing from White Owl without ever losing his temper, and he built a life back for himself. And over time, he was able to become a very prominent leader, and in fact, was ultimately selected to keep the sacred flat pipe. So he was not there. Nevertheless, you can see the, the stakes in this particular kind of game. Of the game. Now, I bring this to your attention to illustrate something. What I want to illustrate is the importance of war deeds in the game itself. So, one thing in a big game that warriors would do when competing with each other was they might stop before they rolled the wheel and think quietly and think intensely about a war deed that they had themselves committed in all this detail and with great truth and accuracy about what they had accomplished. And might say in their minds, the power is known, I'm not telling a lie. They know that this is what happened, this is what I did, this is how it worked. They say it in their minds, they don't tell anybody. The understanding here was that this somehow would harness luck or good fortune that can alter in some way the outcome of the game. The audience knew they were doing this, and they would speculate, whisper in the sidelines, what, what, what D is he going to hit him with? What's it using now? What's, what account of exploit is at work here that can make him win this game? And of course, when I won that particular round, we'll finally say, here is the D that I had thought in my mind that helped me to bring this competition to a successful end. It leads us to wonder, of course, how could concentration on a war D in your own mind, no matter how intensive, alter the outcome of a gambling game. Confidence boost? Well, then why a war tailing a ticket? Why not a hunting expedition? Why not some other very difficult task you would achieve? And also, why such concern for fidelity? Why was it so important to rehearse it exactly and do it right in your mind? Well, it turns out there is a whole cultural, elaborated cultural rule for war stories, in which they are told on many occasions the community I mentioned already, and these occasions in the community are characterized really by two things. Occasions of blessing, like when you name a child, because you want that child to live a long time, that's accompanied by prayers to the one above for a long, long life. By ear piercing, which again is about giving children long, long lives. Or, not just occasions of blessing, but the avoidance of harms. So, for example, if someone violates a ritual taboo and bad things can result when you do that, you can tell a war story to neutralize that may not always come. What we're talking about here, then, is the phenomenon that goes beyond narrative representation, that is, an account of some prior happening, a commemoration, say, to narrative efficacy in the world. That somehow this story changes the course of events to influence the future in some concrete way. And this appears to be a distinctive world cultural psychology. So of what kind? <laughs> Interestingly, my great great grandfather, the boy, <clears throat> elaborated on this very theme with reference to a particular world myth in his collaboration with the anthropologist Father Cooper. In fact, he got a specific question from Father Cooper about robot cosmology. The question was, who among the beings, apart from the supreme being, known to the robots was the most powerful? 
Fair question. The boys answer, a certain boy and his sister. An apparent reference to a myth called the Desert of the Children. This myth was collected and recorded by the anthropologist Alfred Kroger in his visit to Fort Belknap in 1901. Now, if you're interested, you can read this myth in the collected works. I can send you an email if you want to know all the detail. I'm not going to go into all the detail today because it's a bit elaborate. But it starts out with a whole bunch of children being abandoned by their village, left behind as they sneak away from them. These children are taken in by an old woman in the near, old woman in the nearby timber of a river, where they are all killed by this old woman, except one little girl and one her small brother. The girl and boy work for a time for this old woman before discovering that she's a ghost. They thus escape, crossing a river with the help of a water monster. The old woman chases after them, but is killed and eaten by the water monster. The children successfully find their village, but the family claims not to know them, or to recognize them, or acknowledge that they belong to them. In fact, they tie them in a tree and desert them again. Fortunately, a small, sick dog, left behind by the camp, runs to free the children from the tree. The little boy cries out over his abandonment. Um, and I'll just quote from the myth of it here. Quote, then many buffalo came near them. Look at the buffalo, my brother, said the girl. The boy looked at the buffalo, and they fell dead. The girl wondered how they might cut them up. Look at the meat, my younger brother, she said. The boy looked at the dead buffalo, and the meat was all cut up. Then she told him to look at the meat. And when he looked at it, the meat was dried. Then they had much to eat, and the dog became well again. Using such power, the boy and the girl set up a bountiful camp. The dog, it turns out, was revealed to be an old man. They lived right where they had been abandoned, until a man from the village that abandoned them noticed that they were living and had plenty to eat and all kinds of good things. So the people, now starving, moved back toward the camp, but the boy and the girl wouldn't even come out of the teepee to help the starving people. Finally, the girl goes out of the lodge to find marital partners for the three of them. Quote, then the sister told her brother, go outside and look at the camp. The boy went out and looked at the people, and they all fell dead. Now, this kind of myth is a bit out of step with modern sensibilities. A lot of these myths, if you read them, uh, they can seem very unusual, but at least it's a cheery tale. <laughs> The boy's interpretation of this was as follows, quote, the boy had power to do things with his eyes. He would only look and the thing happened as he wished. Ah, you're probably wondering what that title might have meant. The thing happened as he wished. But that was only in combination with his sister. She would do the thinking and then he would do the looking and the thing would happen, especially as a result of the girl's thinking. I think there's some really important and interesting features of this interpretation. First of all, this is so much about kinship and about gender, uh, the complementarity of gender, for example, that's worth noting that. And it's a combination of the looking and, quote, especially the thinking, which points to what we might refer to as the instrumental power of thought. Namely, that thought alters reality. Let's complete the journey here. A key concept in global cosmology has to do with this notion of thought or will or wish. And the anthropologists who helped write about this will say thought hyphen will hyphen wish because it's an idea in which these things go together. Thought will wish is, first of all, a quality of personhood. And as all sentient beings have it. It's an expression of personal desire and it's channeled by concentration of the mind. Interestingly, the supreme being, the one above, has, was recorded as having four different names among the Gorbon. One of those is, uh, translates roughly as he who controls all by the power of thought. In other words, you might think of the supreme being among robots as the prime thinker. And other robots would say that all human beings have their life because of the thinking of the supreme being. Thought will wish is intimately linked to notions of power. Power, we might say, is the efficacious concentration of thought that brings reality into alignment with one's desires. 
Again, power is an attribute of personhood. All sentient beings might exercise such power. But in fact, all beings are actually ranked in terms of their ability to use power. Starting, of course, with the supreme being, the prime thinker, but a whole pantheon of other than humans who are very, very powerful as well. And these folks were acknowledged in formal robot ritual prayers all the time. Uh, the son, the four of men, the last child, and so on. Turns out humans, who also have this power because they're persons, are actually quite low in this hierarchy of power. But older humans have more power than younger humans. And in fact, a really elderly, powerful medicine man was known to be able to kill someone with the power of their thought. <clears throat> Speech, prayer, and ceremony seem as a way to exercise power. Speech probably because you could imagine it as being a combination of thought and breath, which involves the vocal utterance of one's thought. And this again has the potential to alter reality. And so we see that war stories become an important way of altering reality by ritual vocally uttering the essence of a coup tale, which is that these are narratives of agentic triumph in which thought, will, wish have become instrumentally manifest in human action under circumstances harboring the greatest likelihood of destruction when an enemy is trying to best you in battle. So we talk about war stories as representations, say commemorations, but the conditions of narration of coup tales reveal functions beyond representation proper. That is, they involve the circulation of potentially life-generating power, as in naming and your piercing, and a neutralization of potentially destructive power, counting more dangers, reversing taboos, and so on. So, Think back for a moment to the ambiguous instances I referenced from my early research at Fort Belknap about mind, strength of mind, um, the dangers of people intruding into your minds, and so on. The implications, I think, of all this for global cultural psychology, even today, are that there can be obvious concern with protecting the integrity of one's mind and thought, that one can exercise strength of mind, in an instrumental fashion, often in service to well-being or whatever. But one is obligated to police one's speech and thought in moral fashion. That is, there are prescriptions against harboring or expressing ill will, because power is expressed there. And one would experience ambivalence toward the ethos of modern therapeutic expressiveness that you might find in denial services. Hopefully, the foregoing has been of some interest from several different vantage points, but I am a psychologist by vocation and training. And so, let me pause in closing to say what I think all this might illuminate about the prospects for pursuing greater pluralism in the field of psychology. First of all, I think this kind of understanding demonstrates a pluralism in method. For those of you who are not psychologists, you should know that our discipline has come to be defined less by the findings of our research than by the methods we use to conduct research. The intellectual journey I just shared with you suggests that a much wider variety of methods can be helpful and useful in the project to uncover subjugated indigenous knowledge. It involves responding interviews, archival sources, and monographies, and so on. That's the kind of thing that psychologists do not typically draw on. And it involves um, linking to anthropology in very overt ways because of the purpose served by ethnographic contextualization of things that you might not otherwise know about cultural practices, historical and contemporary, absent that kind of um, research being available. And so if you take a case-based analysis, for example, of things that you find out in a uh, reservation setting today, and you put it together with the extent cultural record, sometimes offered by anthropologists, provided that it's quality anthropology, you can de deliver insights that might not have been the case. And because of my colleagues in the psychology department wondering what this work uh, might be accomplishing and what the president was for, I had to actually write an article about this method formalizing and giving a label, even though it really is fairly common sense, I'd say. 
I think this work also documents pluralism in modes of experience. That there are, in fact, distinctive aspects or features or facets of cultural psychology that persist even in modern life. And that these can reflect higher order cosmologies, and they can be referenced in historical or um, traditional myths and tales. And they continue to govern meaningful action. Say things like communicative uh, expression. Who talks with whom about what and under which circumstances? It's very much governed by some of the norms that are sketched out by this sort of understanding. Oops. Um, it recommends pluralism in professional practice, which is part of where the rubber meets the road. That's kind of thing I've been working on most recently. That is, it might invite us to proceed beyond expressive psychotherapy and to consider really alternative, alternative therapeutic traditions. Finally, I think this kind of work affirms pluralism within the U.S. society more broadly. We've got the politics of post-coloniality. We've got instances of community resistance in Indian country. We've got commitments to cultural reclamation that are ongoing and important, and, and um, indigenous self-determination in action in all sorts of ways. And I think because of this very sort of pluralism, uh, it helps to explain why I myself choose not to practice psychotherapy in these particular settings. In the end, we have what I hope is a movement toward a more genuinely inclusive and productive psychology. For more information about all this, you can visit uh, my website where I have publications and so on. Up. But in closing, I want to offer <coughs> heartfelt thanks to my colleagues here at Montana State University who have made this a most welcoming setting so far. So to uh, Professor Fleming, head of the Native Studies, who's um, brought me here, welcome me here, and all my colleagues in Native Studies have been such wonderful folks to get to know, to be great, for helping make this a reality. And Montana State University, I want to convey my gratitude for uh, being your um, very welcome guest. Thank you so much. So the question is, have I developed some alternative approaches, therapeutic approaches, besides psychotherapy, talking therapy, and so on? Well, the first thing I can say about that is that it would be um, presumptuous of me to do that by myself. But what I have done is I've taken partnerships with tribal members and various communities to try to gather um, with, um, alternatives to treatment as usual that take um, stock of traditional understandings and practices. Uh, a whole different talk I could offer would be about uh, partnership with the Blackfeet Nation Substance Abuse Treatment Program. Uh, the director is Pat Packlooking, and uh, we uh, put together uh, an alternative to treatment as usual there that looks very much like um, a culture camp, a cultural immersion camp that has been offered for clients during the summer for a couple of years running now. And, um, you know, because we developed it together. It's really theirs. I mean, it's, they own it, they value it, they keep it going. Um, at this point, our role is pretty minimal. But it is something that we never took together. It's something of which I'm very proud of, and it's something I'd be happy to talk about in a different venue in more detail. Thank you. 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 Thank where you were able to go was hinged on the fact that a person, and I'm sorry I'm getting your lineage, if it was your grandfather who wrote the book, that, that the information was gathered and kind of stayed within the tribe as far as who was writing it down and analyzing it, that it was really internal. And I was curious if you know, if um, is there a lot of that to my, the histories project from the W that's like that, or is it, or was that really special that way? And a lot of the other stuff is more externally written down by outside people. Yeah, so um, I don't know all of the material from the WPA, or the Montana Rights Project from the Indian Reservations. My sense is that something like Bullock's life, though, is pretty distinctive, um, and that uh, Fred Gaughan's work on the Montana Rights Project was somewhat distinctive, too, because I think he wrote and submitted a lot more than was typical of the reservation field workers. Um, it's also distinctive, I think, in the sense that 
Um, this was kind of recovered later by a tribal member and then published, so that hasn't happened very much. Um, but I probably, it's probably not so distinctive in the sense that presumably all the reservation field workers talked with knowledge about others at the time and wrote some stuff down. I suppose what would be interesting would be to compare and contrast you know, how rich is the information they collected and how detailed or elaborated was the written text about it. And in this case, it's pretty elaborate. So in that sense, I think there's both commonalities but distinctions. Yeah? But do you feel to be um, more of a So um, probably one way to do it would be to remember the vignette from the letter in which um, a person, uh, my relative, said she was so angry she wished that a certain person would die. And that her son immediately said, that's wrong, you shouldn't have done that. And she immediately got very anxious, I would say spiritually, morally anxious over the fact that she had wished that and said that. Well, I think that's precisely because or persists to this day at Fort Belknap among Grobans. And I don't think that's just Grobans. I think you would start to do comparative work among other indigenous peoples in North America and start to find that in a lot of places there's still very um, serious concern over policing your thoughts and your words because of the power that is not for altering reality. Yeah, Jeff? Well, uh, thank you. I, I have one more ceremony. We all have ceremonies, and, and, and I have one more. Uh, Native American Studies has, has always uh, had a custom of, of giving a blanket as a gift to our honored visitors. And uh, I, I just want to make sure that we're not then enemy friends. <laughs> <laughs> I, however, do reserve the right to give you hell as much as I can. And so uh, the blanket becomes symbolic of then our wish that uh, Joe will, will continue his journey um, with, with the warmth that we hopefully have, have uh, brought uh, to his life. And uh, so I want to make sure you get your, 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 uh, your, your your right arm free, so he can continue his battle <laughs> while keeping his arm, his shoulder uh, warm. Uh, thank you, and please join us again. We're not taking this food home. Uh, you can visit with Joe uh, more intimately out there. So thank you for coming.